Well, thank you, Steve. Praise team. Is someone inspired today? <laughs> wow. Thank you. So much. That's, that's great. I will remember. That's my new, new favorite song, I'll tell you. Love that song. Let's pray for just a moment. Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable to you, Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. The first scripture today is one that I think we, most of us all know. We could say it by heart probably. It's Psalm 23. It, it's in your pew Bibles. It's back on page 491 if you're following. Uh, as I read this, um, I'm, I'm going to be, re- this is the NRSV version. We've got the pew Bibles, but I remember it as the, in the King James Version. So I think it's almost easier for me as I read, or you could do it from memory uh, using the King James English for this particular wonderful song poem, David. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup overfloweth. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And then over to Revelation, way back, back of the New Testament, Revelation chapter 7, verses 9 through 17. This is page 1122, the back of your Bibles. After this I looked, and there was a great multitude that no one could count from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, robed in white, with palm branches in their hands. They cried out in a loud voice, saying, Salvation belongs to our God who is seated on the throne and to the Lamb. And all the angels stood around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures, and they fell on their faces before the throne and worshiped God, singing, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Then one of the elders addressed me saying, who are these robed in white and where have they come from? I said to him, sir, you are the one that knows. Then he said to me, these are they who have come out of the great ordeal. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the lamb. For this reason, they are before the throne of God and worship him day and night within his temple, and the one who is seated on the throne will shelter them. They will hunger no more and thirst no more. The sun will not strike them nor any scorching heat. For the lamb at the center of the throne will be their shepherd, and he will guide them to springs of the water of life. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. May God grant us understanding and may his Holy Spirit grant us and it help to inform us as we interpret these words for living the Christian life today. Well, it's good to be back after a week or a little bit more off on leave, we, we drove down um, 
south, stopped uh, last week, stopped at the seminary that I graduated from, San Francisco Seminary, and had some, some lectures there and some time with alumni activities of the seminary, and then we drove on down to Santa Barbara, and I deposited my wife there with her mom. She's helping her mom with some things again for, uh, for a couple of weeks at her house down in Santa Barbara. And then I started back out on Monday, driving back north, uh, stayed with a friend on uh, Monday night, friend, best friend from high school, lives up in the Concord Walnut Creek area. And as I was driving north on Monday from Santa Barbara up to the Bay Area, I started hearing on the radio what was happening at the Boston Marathon. And of course, just the story got, as stories sometimes do, the situation seemed to be getting worse and worse. And it's just at that point, when you're back at home and watching television, the stories, you have to, at some point, I have to anyway, turn it off and just put on some music. Because we can only take so much of that which always seems such bad news. And we wonder anymore, sometimes I find myself wondering, what's gonna happen next week? What's gonna happen next month? What can, and how much can we take? Well, so, so I stayed at my friend's house Monday night, got up back on the road Tuesday, and was just sailing along. Great, I got to, uh, a reading by lunchtime, and I said, boy, this is great, I'll be, be home soon and getting over the hill. You know how sometimes when things seem to be going so well <laughs> that something happens, and you're thinking so confidently, gonna be home in about three hours, and uh, took off from reading, and, uh, and lunch there took off, and got up, um, to the, got up the hill, a little bit out of Reading, up to where, you know, you're going by the lake there. And uh, all of a sudden, the road felt different. And I thought, that's weird. And then I noticed there was, a, there was an engine light <laughs> flashing on the car. <laughs> okay, now this is a Subaru with 92,000 miles on it, but it's not supposed to do that. So <laughs> at least that's what I was told. So I fortunately was able to get the car off the, the off-ramp um, at that boat launch area with a store, and there's even a motel there and stuff, and I got it off there, and yeah, the engine light, there was some strange noise going on inside. I'm probably the least mechanical person in this room, so <laughs> I don't have a clue, but I knew something was wrong and maybe very long with the noise there. So anyway, called, got towed back to, to Reading uh, for some, some beginning analysis in the shop, but then eventually got back home, thanks to, <laughs> thank, thanks to uh, Tim and Pam Meidinger finally for, um, well, no, first of all, I wanna say that we found out that uh, Lynn Wilkins happened to be in Reading at the same time doing family stuff, so she actually lent me her car right there so I could get home. She had other, other means of transportation. So thank to the Wil thanks to the Wilkins. And then uh, Tim and Pam Meidinger, and, and also thanks to uh, Randy Bakke, uh, use of his truck. And they went down, hauled the car back up, and now it's in a shop here in town because we wanted to get it back home. Uh, for it to be worked on. So anyway, I don't know, can you pray for a car? You know, you can pray for a car anyway. <laughs> so we'll find out. We'll find out the, the diagnosis soon enough. But um, anyway, as I say, you know, we don't want to get into that negative thinking where you always, things are going really well and then you think and there must be something wrong. <laughs> you don't want to go there, but sometimes you have those days anyway. So it's good, it's good to be back. When we see the news as it happened this week, sometimes, as I said, we just, we just have to turn it off. 
And that's when this, these scripture passages like today can be so helpful to us and to remind us that we are still in that Easter tide season. Both of the passage today, and, and there's other passages also for today too, that, that give us this, this Easter tide hope. But um, these passages today, this, this beautiful poem, song of David, and written centuries before Easter actually happened. And then this passage from Revelation, really a book written to give Christians hope that we're facing persecution in the Roman Empire. And these, um, these passages give us hope even in the face of death. And we certainly do need hope today. Well, anyway, when, so when we were down in Santa Barbara last weekend, um, something interesting happened, a, kind of a coincidental thing with, with a, uh, the talk that I gave a couple of weeks ago. Saturday night, we got into, into Santa Barbara, and I noticed in the newspaper an ad for uh, a special speaker at First Presbyterian Santa Barbara. It's a church that we visit occasionally. And... Um, and they, they were going to have Dr. Ronald White, who's actually a historian, but he's also been dean of students at the seminary that I graduated from. He's written books on Abraham Lincoln. He's, he's quite a well-known Lincoln scholar, and he's also written a book just specifically on Abraham Lincoln's second inaugural address that I used as one of my reference materials in the talk that I gave a couple of weeks ago about issues in church and society, issues that divide us as Christians. And so here he was um, giving that talk. So we went to worship there at First Press, and, and he talked about that address where Abraham Lincoln was trying to give the nation hope in the face of this horrendous war that took six to 700,000 lives. If we put that in, in today's Today's date, if a war like that happened here today, it'd be five million souls lost, if you can imagine. Lincoln trying to give the nation hope and struggle theologically with what was happening in that north and south, as he said, reading the same Bible, praying to the same God. He was trying to, I believe, give the country hope. When we were at First Press that day, we were walking around the grounds and looking at their little chapel and uh, someone just, I overheard someone saying that there would be a funeral that afternoon there at First Press for a baby. And I just thought, wow, does that family need hope? The beautiful, beautiful poetry of Psalm 23 gives us that, that great renewal. You know, it's a very interesting poem. We often use that Psalm 23 at memorial and funeral services, but it's also an amazing uh, poem for the Eastertide season, for what, what's been called uh, Shepherd Sunday, you could, you could give a theme this Sunday of Jesus as shepherd, Jesus as the good shepherd. It's, it's, a, it's a writing and a song that can be used because, in this case because every time that we gather in a memorial for those that know Christ and as the gathered community, what it is is a witness to the resurrection. It's a witness to the Easter faith. This Easter faith, this Easter tide season that we are on, that we remind each other Sunday after Sunday that we're here because of Easter. We're here because God raised Jesus from, de from death and a horrible death to new life. As I remember reading Psalm 23 as a kid, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. And I went, uh, what? what do you mean I shall not want? <laughs> I shall not want? No, <laughs> of course. 
It's I shall not lack. But as a kid, I didn't know. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not lack. So often we think we lack so much. The Lord is my shepherd. shepherd, I shall not lack. I shall not lack. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. Can you picture that? That's an amazing statement of Sabbath rest. When I was at the seminary, one of the speakers talked about the idea of Sabbath rest as being almost like part of the the new life or the Eastern new life. The idea that everything that we do as people of God, is, is based in the Sabbath rest. It's not something we get to at the end of the week. It's something we begin the week with. We're beginning our week today. Like Easter begins a new life. And we begin in this Sabbath rest. In, in a sense, it's the beginning of the new creation. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. And then to read again from Revelation 7, first verse 9. After this I looked, and there was a great multitude that no one can count from every nation. Jews and Gentiles, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, robed in white, with palm branches in their hands. Down in 13, then one of the elders addressed me, saying, who are these robed in white, and where have they come from? I said to him, sir, you are the one that knows. Then he said to me, these are they who have come out of the great ordeal. What was he talking about? The tribulation robed in white, martyrs, martyrs in the faith, giving their lives sometimes simply because they said the most ancient basic confession of faith that we know of, they simply said Jesus is Lord, and in the Roman Empire, Caesar was Lord. If you said Jesus was Lord, wrong answer. And they paid with their lives sometimes. Simply by saying, Jesus is Lord. Revelation is really that book of hope for those early Christians facing the persecution and the martyrdom in the Roman Empire. Those coming through that great ordeal, they will find hope. No more hunger and thirst. For the great shepherd will guide them to those springs of living water. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. My friends, this all comes from what happened on Easter. I want to ask you something, my friends. Have you invited that neighbor, that co-worker, that family member or friend of yours who does not know Christ in his church, have you invited him or her to a place where they can catch a glimpse of this Eastertide hope? And can they see that Eastertide hope in you and me? Let us pray. Lord God, we thank you for these scriptures. We thank you for the work of your spirit. We thank you for what you did on Easter that grants us hope and strength even as we walk through the valley of the shadow of death. We will not fear because you are with us. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Okay, so remember, we're we're still uh, we're still in the Easter tide season. Alleluia! Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. 
Amen. God bless you all. Amen. Amen. <laughs> okay.